The Forgotten Cause of the Civil War, A New Look at the Slavery Issue by Lawrence R. Tinsley. There were many reasons why the Civil War was fought. Perhaps the two most salient for the North were preserving the Union and preventing the expansion of slavery into the territories. For the South, the two most frequently referred to have been the right of secession and allowing slavery to expand into the territories. There is, however, a relatively little known explanation which has not received the attention it so justly deserves, and that is white slavery, the forgotten cause of the Civil War. If cause can be defined as any political or social dynamic which exacerbated the tension between the North and the South, then white slavery certainly qualifies because it contributed to the deep-rooted frictions which existed between the free and slave sections of the country. White people being slaves in the American South may seem unbelievable at first, and that being a cause of the Civil War even more far-fetched. But as readers will come to understand, the archival evidence the contemporary publications and documents of the day conclusively proves the case. In 1860, Abraham Lincoln's campaign newspaper said, the human mind is so constituted that it is prone to regard as right what has come down to us approved by long usage. The topic of slavery by long usage has traditionally been thought of exclusively in terms of black slavery and as a consequence, the issue of white slavery continues to be omitted from discussions about the institution of slavery in America. The idea that slavery existed in our country cannot be separated from race. So racial issues play an important role in the story to be told. White slavery in the South necessarily had to do with race, the one drop rule, and white mulattoes. In America today, the term mulatto is often found to be offensive by many people of mixed white and black heritage. However, utilizing the term in a historical context is a necessary and privileged use with no derogatory connotations whatsoever. What does mulatto mean? A mulatto is commonly thought of as a person who has a medium brown complexion, one whose parentage is of both white and black. This is the literal meaning. Another meaning exists as well, a meaning much more relevant to this study. Throughout the slavery days, a slave was a mulatto if he or she had any degree of white and black parentage. It must be clearly understood that even after many generations, white people who had a mere one drop of black blood could be and were enslaved as mulattoes, white mulattoes. That is to say, white slaves. These individuals looked white and had no visible African ancestry whatsoever. Many people have heard of the one drop rule whereby the most infinitesimal amount of black blood makes one black. What is often overlooked, however, is the fact that in reality, this is a social classification. A white person and a person who has a distant black ancestor but no discernible black traits look the same and are both physiologically white human beings. It was a common thinking in the North to hold that slaves who looked like white people were white people and not mulattoes, not black people. As will be seen, the political ramifications of white slavery were ultimately a cause of the Civil War. Black blood is a race-related expression that was used memorably in the popular Broadway musical and motion picture showboat, adapted from the novel of the same name by Edna Ferber. The story begins in the 1870s, and as in antebellum days, interracial marriage was illegal throughout the South. Julie is a white mulatto, living as a white woman, who is married to Steve, a white man. Hella Morgan and Ava Gardner, both white women, have played the role of Julie. 
Upon hearing that the local sheriff was about to challenge their marriage, a dramatic scene unfolds where Steve pricks Julie's finger and sucks out a drop of her blood. The sheriff comes on board and declares that one drop of black blood makes you black in these parts. Steve had met the criteria. Unquestionably, there is no difference in the blood of whites and blacks, as attested to by the fact that blood transfusions routinely occur with donors and recipients being of different races. For the purpose of clarity and discussions having to do with racial mixture, the expression black blood has conveniently been utilized in a figurative sense as a literary device. The term white slavery has been used both literally and figuratively throughout the text, and important classifications are necessary for understanding the difference. To begin with, in a general literal sense, white slavery had to do with the white mulattoes described earlier, white people who were born into slavery and remained there for life. White slavery had two very different figurative meanings. Southerners used the term figuratively to describe white laborers in the North who were living in poverty in conditions that were worse, in their view, than those of their black slaves. Throughout the North, however, figurative white slavery had to do with the South threatening to subjugate and usurp Northern political power, thereby turning free Northerners into slaves forced to adhere to Southern dictates. Michael F. Holt, a historian of note who has studied the politics of the 1850s, describes the aspect of figurative white slavery as follows. The word slavery had long had a definite meaning aside from institutions of black slavery in the South. Slavery implied subordination to tyranny, the loss of liberty and equality, the absence of republicanism. What was at stake was not just the wrong of black slavery or even the possibility of its spread, bad as that may be. What was ultimately at stake in the sectional conflict was the enslavement of white Americans in the North by despotic slaveholders bent on crushing their liberties, destroying their equality in the nation, and overthrowing the Republican principle of majority rule. Taking figurative white slavery to its logical conclusion, if Northerners were made slaves to Southerners' political power, such power might actually be able to literally enslave white people, particularly those white laborers who were poor and vulnerable. As this text will show, such a potential was in fact believed by many. White slavery in this sense does not negate the commonly understood figurative meaning but rather expands it to encompass a literal meaning as well. White slavery in this literal sense indicates actual physical enslavement, outright ownership, often expressed in antebellum days as property in man, or as capital should own labor. White slavery in its literal sense indicates actual physical enslavement, outright ownership, often expressed in antebellum days as quote, property in man, or, quote, capital should own labor. These various figurative and literal meanings are very different from one another, but the context in which they are found will denote the meaning intended. When the context is uncertain, white slavery will be taken to mean figurative white slavery together with the belief in the possibility or even probability of literal white slavery. The broad usage of this term is easily illustrated by the fact that there were entire works based on different denotations. In 1855, the American Anti-Slavery Society published White Slavery in the United States, which had to do with white mulattoes and literal white slavery. That same year, White Slavery or The Fruit of Union with American Tyrants by Thomas B. McCormick was also published addressing figurative white slavery and the story of an anti-slavery minister whose legal rights were brutalized by Southern political power. 
Understand that in general, the white slavery described in this volume is not about the indentured servants of the 1600s and 1700s who were sometimes referred to as white slaves while in servitude during their five to seven year terms. Why is white slavery virtually unknown? Given the sensitive nature of the subject matter, the obvious answer is that this history, despite being factually correct, is politically incorrect. Actually, such political incorrectness is nothing new. Having originally appeared way back in the first generation of history books, which were published during and after the Civil War, the issue of white slavery was totally omitted from such popular titles as John W. Draper, History of the American Civil War, 1867, Joshua R. Giddings, History of the Rebellion, 1864, Horace Greeley, The American Conflict, 1864, Benjamin E. Green, The Irresponsible Conflict, 1872, James Spence, The American Union, 1861, William Taylor, Cause and Probable Results of the Civil War in America, 1862, and Henry Wilson, History of the Rise and Fall of the Slave Power in America, 1872. Just as it is politically incorrect to speak of white slavery today, such was also the case back then. Look at the work of Henry Wilson, for example. In 1860, in How Ought Working Men to Vote in the Coming Election, he addressed the threat of white slavery and spoke heavily on the figurative and literal enslavement of northern whites, particularly poor white laborers, if slavery were ever nationalized across the country. Yet, in his history of the rise and fall of the slave power in America in 1872, hardly a word is mentioned in this regard. In 1876, Reverend Elias Nason and Thomas Russell published a biography of Wilson, which included excerpts from his more notable speeches. Although portions were cited from the 1860 speech, the provocative passages were neatly edited out. There were two references to capital should own labor, the belief that labor in the North should be owned and not hired, but these were made after the omissions and therefore out of context. From 1861 to 1865, our nation was at war, a civil war. There were brothers, fathers, sons, and extended family members killing one another. During that time and afterwards, peace and reconciliation were watchwords of the day. For Northerners to speak of Southerners actually enslaving white people, so-called white mulattoes and express the belief that a nationalized slavery would enslave more whites in the North would most certainly have been politically incorrect. Surely given the social context of the time and the national desire for reunification, such political incorrectness is quite understandable. In 1879, a mere 14 years after the Civil War, Charles Godfrey Leland published a biography of Abraham Lincoln in which he described the desire for peace and reconciliation on the part of the North after the president was assassinated. It so happened that just at this time, the North, weary of war and willing to pardon every enemy, had no desire to be vindictive. When Jefferson Davis was tried, Mr. Greeley eagerly stepped forward to be his bail, and there were many more looking towards reconstruction and reconciliation or to office and diverse to drive the foe to extremes. Perhaps they were right. For in great emergencies, minor interests must be forgotten. It was the Union men and the victories who were now nobly calling for peace at any price and forgiveness. The political incorrectness of the issue in the past makes sense. What is remarkable is that despite all of the primary source material and archival documents available, the notion of white slavery is still considered to be politically incorrect generations later. The fact that this subject continues to go unaddressed is exemplified by the Southern Historical Association, which has published a 
prestigious journal of Southern history since 1935, and four comprehensive indexes ranging from 1935 to 1984, not a single entry for white slavery is to be found. The omission is the the omission in the indexes brings to mind the words of Samuel Butler, who wrote, It has been said that though God cannot alter the past, historians can. The past has indeed been altered by the omission of white slavery from scholarly discussions. The political incorrectness of white slavery today is of a different nature than that of the past. For at the present time, the belief exists that addressing the issue of white slaves in some way diminishes or belittles black slavery. The truth of the matter is that the raping of black women, the horrors of the Middle Passage, the parting of families on the auction block, and the many other unspeakable brutalities endured under black slavery can in no way be lessened in importance or significance by speaking of white slaves, who were merely the byproduct of black slavery and a relatively small part in the overall picture of slave life in America. The author's intent in examining the subject of white slavery is one of scholarship, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. To speak of white slavery, white people who were slaves in the South and the threat of the same in the North is in no way meant to minimize or marginalize the black experience of slavery in America. The use of capitalization here is intentional. Today, there are a number of African American people who consider the very mention of white slavery to be an affront to what many in their community refer to as the black Holocaust. It must be pointed out, however, that the black community does not speak with a unified voice in this matter because it is a complex one. While it is certainly true that there were a great many more black slaves than white ones, black teachers of American history have expressed enthusiasm for having the existence of white slaves widely known. Some have even conceptualized the omission of white slaves from American history textbooks as a subtle form of racism. Many have stated that the self-esteem of black students would be raised significantly if it were taught and ultimately commonly known that not all slaves were black, that there were white slaves as well. By the same token, many in the black community with whom this author has spoken think that knowing that there were white slaves as well as black ones challenges the belief of white superiority held by a number of white Americans. Raising the self-esteem of black youth in America is an admirable goal, as is dispelling the myth of racial superiority. May this volume make a positive contribution in both of those directions. In a book having to do with the Civil War era, the path inevitably leads to Abraham Lincoln. Readers will find that the Richmond Enquirer has been quoted extensively herein. This preeminent Southern newspaper was the major source Lincoln used to keep track of political climates in the South. Although he also read the Charleston Mercury, it was the Richmond Enquirer which was cited by name in several of his speeches. Henry C. Whitney, a noted biographer and legal colleague of Lincoln, states that Lincoln obtained his idea of the drift of popular sentiment in the South, largely, if not indeed chiefly, from that organ. The words you will read from the Richmond Enquirer were the same words Lincoln read. Rare editions of Lincoln's 1860 campaign newspaper, The Rail Splitter, and other newspapers have also been utilized to give insight into the emotional climate of the times as only newspapers can do. Usage of the term the South needs a word of explanation as well. The South refers to the slaveocracy, the political power which governed the slave states, not the Southern people in general. This definition embodies an important point. There were many poor and many non-slaveholding whites throughout the South. 
There were many poor and many non-slaveholding whites throughout the southern states who had virtually no influence on pro-slavery politics and therefore did not comprise the South in a political sense. The oligarchy of Southern politicians and their slaveholding allies were the power of the South, what came to be known as the slave power. The United States Census of the 1840, 1850, and 1860 are an important part of the story to be told. In each census, there were categories for free colored, consisting of free blacks and free mulattoes enumerated together and slaves. When referring to the census, these two terms will appear in the text with capitalization and quotation marks. In a context other than the census, the term free people of color will refer to free blacks and free mulattoes as one group. Likewise, people of color will be taken to mean blacks and mulattoes in general. An abundance of historical material has been quoted verbatim throughout this work. In an effort to help readers get a better feel for the time period, this primary source material has been kept in its original form and has not been modernized. The letter N in the word Negro has not been capitalized if that was the way it originally appeared. Other archaic and unusual capitalizations as well as British spellings have also been retained. As a practical matter, however, a few quotations in difficult archaic English have been changed to modern English. Antebellum printing typically contains common spelling errors. Rather than burden the eye of the reader by using sick after each example, but in keeping with its historical context. These misspellings have not been corrected. Old-fashioned punctuation, which frequently includes the use of unexpected and excessive commas, has not been modernized either. All italics and quotations have been retained, as have the italicized names of newspapers and court cases, when originally appearing so. If expedient or necessary for syntax, the first letter of the first word in certain quotations has been capitalized or put into lowercase, opposite that of the original. Paraphrases have been kept to an absolute minimum, so what will be read are the exact words and punctuations of those who wrote back in slavery times, particularly the decade of the 1850s, the years during which the politics of civil war accelerated. Since much of this subject matter is considered to be controversial, white slavery, mulatto inferiority, slave smuggling, slave breeding, kidnapping, the direct quotations establish solid authenticity and provide readers with original primary source material from which they may draw their own conclusions. Personal and professional perspective has been addressed from a variety of eyewitness accounts to congressional speeches by northern politicians who were concerned about the threat of white slavery posed on the free north. Another editorial decision had to do with designing the index for this book. The extensive scholarly index had been primarily structured in terms of concepts rather than mere keywords. Indexing subject matter, which is unfamiliar to many readers, required an atypical approach. A word about what this study is and what it is not. This text focuses in on one small yet significant facet of antebellum life in America, and that is white slavery in the South and its implications for the North. The institution of slavery in general has not been addressed per se, nor have specific aspects such as the positive good theory, which have been explained in detail elsewhere and are beyond the scope of this present work. Dozens of marvelous volumes have already been done on antebellum American politics in general, as well as the Republican, Democratic, and other political parties in particular. These subjects have not been rehashed either, 
but will be included when deemed necessary to clarify a context in which white slavery or a related issue is being discussed. In addition, it is being pointed out that this book explains the work of one racial theorist, Dr. Josiah Clark Knott, whose original theories were directly concerned with white slaves and white slavery. slavery. Thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes the preface to The Forgotten Cause of the Civil War, A New Look at the Slavery Issue. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for listening.